of those who are fighting, all right? And we're going to see 300 more were slain in Shushan the palace. Now you say, Dr. Corral, I understand this literally, but now tell me the spiritual meaning of this whole thing. All right, number one, hanging on the gallows in English is what it says in our English text. But that is not the way it reads in Hebrew. I cannot even understand any type of relationship between hanging on the gallows and hanging on the tree. Because there is no relationship between hanging on the gallows and hanging on the tree. But it says it in Hebrew, let the ten sons of Haman hang on the tree. So we have hanging on a tree as a, as a theme throughout the book of Esther. And every time we see a victory, every time we see an enemy destroyed, we will see the theme hung on a tree. In this particular case, we see the ten sons of Haman for another war to go on. Their dead bodies are going to hang on a tree, which is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ's cross, the cross of Calvary. The tree is the focus, and every enemy was destroyed and put on public display because of his victory. Can I get a witness somewhere? Somebody ought to say the cross spoiled principalities and powers and made an open show of them publicly. Can I get a witness somewhere? Okay, there are some of you here that don't quite understand what I'm talking about, all right, because we don't understand blood evidence, all right? So let me just tell you, hanging on a tree, this phrase is a phrase throughout the book of Esther. I want to take you back to another portion of the book of Esther so that you will understand that hanging on a tree represents the cross of Calvary and the enemies that are going to hang on a tree in the book of Esther prophetically parallel every enemy that the cross destroyed. Prophetically parallel every demonic power that the cross destroyed. The cross destroyed the stronghold of Haman. The cross destroyed the ten sons of Haman. Can I get a witness some well. All right, so let us go back, if you will, to Esther chapter 3. And I want you to see in Esther chapter 3 the rise of Haman, which represents the seat of evil. It represents evil incarnate. There has never been another human being in the Bible that is as wicked besides Judas Iscariot, that is as wicked as Haman. All right, Haman devised the death decree of the Jews. And the Bible tells us then King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. I want you to understand that princes are not only literal princes, but princes represent principalities and powers of darkness. I want you to understand that Haman's promotion represents the mystery of sometimes how evil rises to power suddenly. But God says they rise to power to a higher place because it's God's will for their fall to be even greater. Can I get a witness somewhere? Somebody ought to say, my feet almost slipped. I almost lost my faith until I came into the sanctuary of the Lord, the psalmist said, and I understood their end, that God set them up that they might have a fall. And this is why God allowed Haman to be in such a high place, because God wanted his fall to be fast and furious. Can I get a witness somewhere? The psalmist says in Psalm 73, he says, I, 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 discovered this. I prayed. It dismayed me until I understood that God set them up in slippery places that he might 
bring them down in an instant. I want you to know your enemies are about to fall in an instant. God is about to bring down strongholds, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in an instant because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to explain this to you. All right. First of all, we're going to see in Esther chapter 3. I want you to see the day the death decree was signed. The death decree against the Jewish people. How dare Haman. The death decree against the Jewish people was signed in the first month, in the 13th day of the month. The Bible says, King Ahasuerus took his ring from his hand, verse 10, and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said to Haman, verse 11, the silver is given to you and the people also do with them as it seemeth good to you. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month. So here we have on the 13th day of the first month, everything written that Haman is going to write in this death decree. And it's going to be distributed throughout the empire. So I want you to understand the time zone here, all right? I want you to understand the 13th day of the month of Nisan, the first month, the death decree is signed. The very same day, the self-same day, Mordecai goes to the king's gate in sackcloth mourning and has his ashes upon his head. The very same day on the 13th day of the first month, Esther sends him clothing and compels him to change his garments. She does not know the death decree has been written. He tears off the death decree off of a tree and sends it to Esther. Esther gets the message through Hatak that the people are up for annihilation. And Mordecai requests that she go before the king and plead with her people. She, at the first does not want to go, but immediately she changes her, her words and she immediately uh, says, I will go. As soon as she said, I will go, the Esther fast begins. And this is the 13th day of the first month. So we have day one. Okay, the, day two is the second day of Esther's fast. Day three, on the third day of Esther's fast, this is the 15th day of Nisan, because you have Nisan 1, the 13th day, the death decree is signed, and Esther's fast begins. Uh, Nisan 2, Passover, or Nisan uh, 14, that's Passover on the second day, second day of Esther's fast. Um, the, third, the third day is uh, Nisan 15, and that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the day the children of Israel came out of Egypt. And that was the day that, that God said for a memorial for seven days. This is a great day. They did not celebrate Passover that year. They fasted with Esther. Okay? So we have three days. The third day is also the first day of the banquet. The 16th of Nisan, three days later. Touch your neighbor and say, it just took three days. Say this with me, three days to hang, hang Haman on a tree. Say it again, three days hung on a tree. Say it again, three days hung on a tree. Say this with me, you cannot understand the tree without three days. Because the three days are the type and the shadow of the resurrection of our Lord. That he made an open show of the display of all principality and power. It only took three days for Haman to be dead. As soon as that death decree was written, within three days he was gone. Can I get a witness somewhere? I want you to know you should say thank God for the three days. Thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for the tree that Jesus hung on. This is where all power principalities were destroyed on the tree. Can I get a witness somewhere? All right. Now I want you to, just for a moment, you can never, you can never talk about the three days without the tree. Say this with me. The tree is never separated from the three days. They go together. Say this with me. They go together. 
You see, the tree, when you see the tree and you see the three days, it is a symbol of the work of Calvary's cross. It is a symbol of blood evidence. There you have blood evidence in the book of Esther that shows us what the cross accomplished. When you see Haman hanging on the tree, it represents every demonic power, every seat of evil that the cross destroyed. When you see the ten sons of Haman hung publicly so that the war could continue and so that Esther would demand that every evil um, every evil enemy of the Jewish people would be destroyed during that war of Shushan, uh, the, the third day of Purim. I want you to understand this represents the finishing off. You are not going to have a few spirits left over in your life to torture you. You are not going to have a few words or things from your past to bring you down. Every demonic power, every prince Every wicked spirit was destroyed by the cross of Jesus. Can I get a witness somewhere? If you will go with me very quickly to Genesis chapter 1 verse 11, you are going to see that the cross is never separated from the tree. We will see on the third day of creation, God waited for the third day to create the tree. The tree was not created with other parts of the earth. The tree and wheat were created together on the third day. And here we see, beloved people, the Bible says in verse 11 of Genesis 1, it says, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree, after its kind, whose seed is in itself, hallelujah, upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed, after its kind, yielding fr uh, um, tree, yielding fruit, whose seed is in itself, hallelujah. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. The tree created on the third day. Say this with me, the tree and the third day representing how God ordained before the foundation of the world that every principality and every power would be crushed by the cross of Jesus Christ and through his resurrection. You cannot separate the cross from the resurrection. The cross and the resurrection are one. Can I get a witness somewhere? The resurrection is the finishing of the cross. It is the completion of the work of Calvary. All right. Now, I want you to see another symbol so that you fully understand. Say this with me. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word of God be established. So we see in the war in Shushan, which represents Esther was not satisfied with the victories of the 13th of Adar. She wanted every single spirit, every attitude, everything that would endear, endanger the Jewish people again to ensure that it would never raise up its ugly head again against the people who lived in Persia, specifically in Shushan, that they would never be ever able again to have a, a thought or even dare to write anything against the Jewish people. So she requested in her final request to the king, one more day of battle. One more day I'm asking. Haman wrote a death decree that we already defeated on the 13th of Adar. But on the 14th of Adar, I'm asking for one more battle. And that those 10 sons of Haman that were already slain on the 13th of Adar, that their bodies would be collected, hung on the tree, because hanging on the gallows is hanging on the tree. Say it with me. Hanging on the gallows is hanging on the tree. Because in Hebrew, hanging on the gallows is not written. It is written hung on a tree. Say it with me. Hung on a tree. Hanged on a tree. You see, the Bible tells us 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Galatians 3.13. So that when we see hanging on a tree, it represents every curse, every wicked power, every demonic seat of authority. It represents every vile thing from the pit of hell, every imagination, every stronghold, every strong man that would ever come against you, your children, your family, your business, destroyed through the tree. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 verse 30, whom you slew on a tree. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10 verse 39, Jesus who hung on a tree. So we must understand the concept of hanging on a tree, synonymous, spiritually synonymous with hanging on the cross. All right, so here we see in Shushan the palace this incredible victory, and the victory takes place because the ten sons of Haman, ten being a number of atonement, piled on top of each other, dead corpses, hanging on a tree. She wanted to mock. She wanted to display the power of God and what he does to demonic spirits and what he does to principalities and powers. Hanging on the tree to show us the power of what happens through the power of the cross and the tree of Jesus. I want to share with you one more witness in another portion of scripture that will show you the power of the third day and hanging on a tree. This may seem a little ambiguous to some of us and may be a message that might seem hard to decipher. How can you connect the cross of Calvary and hanging on a tree to the dreams Joseph interpreted? I want you to understand the dreams Joseph interpreted were so important because they were the stepping stone to him coming out of the prison and coming into the palace for the glory of God. If it had not been for the dreams Joseph interpreted to the butler and to the baker, Joseph would have never, at least in God's plan at the time, have been able to come up out of that prison and take the seat next to Pharaoh and rule over the land of Egypt and in one day be completely transformed. It was through the dreams that Joseph interpreted in the prison. And hidden in those dreams is a mystery. Hidden in those dreams is the supernatural secret of the cross of Jesus Christ. Hidden in those dreams, you will understand what the cross did for you. Because every place you see the tree and what is hanging on the tree, you will be able to understand the power that Jesus has over evil and even over evil situations, over darkness that happens in our life, trials and tribulations that we feel we can never get out of, prisons that we feel we're locked in for the rest of our life. The power of God through the tree released us. Go with me for a moment to Genesis chapter 40. I want you to see this. Genesis chapter 40. Joseph has been in the prison now for a while. He has been falsely accused for a crime he did not commit. Joseph has been in this prison, this dark prison, this place wanting to get out of there, but still holding on to the promise of God. Some of you are holding on to the promise of God. You feel like you've been in a prison for a long time. You feel like you can't hold on another day. You say, God, I have waited on you. God, I have been trusting you. God, when is my breakthrough coming? God, when am I going to see your victory in my life? Many of you here have been asking God, just like Joseph, some of you have been put in this place and you say, I don't understand it. First of all, I want you to understand that it is the king's prison. 
All right, because the Bible says that Joseph was taken and he was not put in the common prison. He was put into the king's prison. This means the king has control over the situation and you need not worry because if it's the king's prison, you're coming out of this and you're going to come into a place of promotion. You are going to come into a place of glory. You are going to come into a, a place that you never thought possible. God is going to give you supernatural multiplication in the midst of all your tribulation he is going to give you divine compensation for all your tribulation watch this now joseph is in the prison and they understand he's an interpreter of dreams the two have dreams and they said unto him in genesis 40 verse 8 we have dreamed a dream and there is no interpreter and Joseph said unto them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray thee. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. And it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth. And the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Now, why is the scripture going into such detail over two insignificant persons? They don't have a role like the patriarchs. They are not prophets. They really are just inserted in the book of Genesis. They don't have a key role like Jacob, Abraham, Isaac. We look at the the amount of space scripture gives these dreams, and you compare it to even some of the space God gives to some of the most important people in the Bible. Isaac doesn't get a whole lot of space. We, we know about Isaac in Genesis 22, but the only way we really know Isaac is one chapter. We get chapter 26 of Genesis. That's it. And a few other stories where he is involved, like Genesis 27. So how can it be that two men seem to not have any biblical significance? They don't play a role, very, a, a, a huge role on the stage of salvation history. Yet their dreams are so important. Why are their dreams important? Why did scripture go into detail to tell us every detail of the dream wouldn't it be easier to just say they dreamt dreams? And the, the butler remembered Joseph. Wouldn't that be just enough? Why does it need to go into detail to tell us the three branches and the grapes and the cup? And why does it need to go into detail about the Rasha, the evil one, who was the, the baker? We're going to get details on his dream too. If we look at it just for a moment, let us look for a second. And the Bible says, yet within three days, Joseph is going to interpret. And he says, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, verse 12. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it, three days. The three branches are three days. Verse 13, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up your head and restore you to your place. Three days being restored to your place. Say this with me, three days being restored to my place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand, and after the former manner, when thou was his butler. But think on me, hallelujah, when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I pray unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. And that's exactly what happened through the dreams. Now we're going to look at another dream. The Bible says, and when the chief baker, verse 16, saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the utmost basket there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days, Pharaoh shall lift up your head from off you and hang you on a tree. And the bird shall eat thy flesh from off thee. 
And it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler, but the chief baker, um, and, and the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. And he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. What does this mean? This means that it was through these dreams... And we see hanged on a tree on the third day, representing the cross and the resurrection of our Lord, hidden in those dreams so that we would know the power of the cross and the resurrection that pulled Joseph up out of the pit and brought Joseph into a place of rulership with Pharaoh. I want you to know that the reason the Bible goes into that detail is that Scripture is is showing us blood evidence. The scripture is showing us the power of the cross that through the tree you also shall be pulled up out of your prison. That through the tree God shall vindicate you. That through the tree God shall give you double for your shame. That through the tree you shall rule and reign over your enemies. That through the tree you shall have a place of authority and God will give you back everything that the enemy has stolen. Can I get a witness somewhere? Stand to your feet and give God the praise right now.